We are in a sermon series called Comfort One Another, and the thing about comfort is that those who need comfort are those who are in pain. And we've been talking about affliction, and we've been talking about pain. And today we're going to be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and the title of this morning's sermon is The Power of a Thorn. Most ladies love pearls. Uh, Those pearls look nice. Those pearls are expensive, and there's a reason that they are expensive. The reason that pearls are expensive is because they were born out of affliction. They look nice now, but if you could have seen them when they were being constructed, they were constructed in affliction. That oyster or clam had something foreign enter into it, something unplanned, something uninvited, something unexpected that made its way inside of its shell that created an irritation. It may have been a grain of sand or some other foreign particle. It wasn't asked for, it just showed up. And it created an irritation, an irritation that would not go away because it was lodged inside the shell creature. Because the oyster or the clam could not remove the problem, it had to come up with a way to cope with the problem. It couldn't get rid of it. It had to cope with it. And the way that it coped with it was to secrete a substance that I was unfamiliar with until this past week. But the substance is called nacar. It's a white, creamy, milky substance uh, that is secreted from the membrane inside of the oyster or the clam. And the shelled creature will coat this foreign object with nacar. And the purpose of coating this foreign object with nacar is to deal with the irritation. It's something designed by God to help it live with what it couldn't get rid of. Here's the thing about that. It took place over the course of a long period of time, and that's why pearls are expensive. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's something that this clam or this oyster would coat over top of it time and time again, and you eventually get to wear it around your neck or around your wrist. Because out of the irritation has become a pearl. And the pearl did not start out as a pearl. It started out as an irritant, something unexpected, unwelcomed, uninvited. But all of a sudden, a pure mess is transformed into a mighty miracle. Now, we've been talking about pain and we've been talking about affliction and specifically about comforting those who are in pain and affliction. Our text this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 7. Follow along as I read. Paul writes and he says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord to two, uh, three times that it might leave me. And God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with the weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is now going to give us an illustration that speaks out of his own life experience. And we've been having several messages on pain and affliction come from 2 Corinthians because there are a lot of lessons that we can glean from the trials and the sufferings that Paul himself went through. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul now takes a shift and he gets personal. And he reminds us through his own experiences how God is using him to minister to those around him. And Paul starts off by stating the reality of his situation. Let me read verse 7 again. It says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Some are here today and they have a thorn in their flesh. And so I think an appropriate place for us to begin our time together is by simply defining what a thorn is. The Greek word for thorn means splinter or needle. 
And a lot of us have had a splinter from time to time. It's nothing that's going to threaten to take our life, but it's rather something that is there that's nagging and annoying us. In fact, let me give you beyond what the Greek word means and give you a working definition so that we're all on the same page. This is what a thorn is. A thorn is an irritation that nags you. A thorn is an irritation that nags you. (laughs) And I see some of you are saying, well, I'm sitting next to my thorn here this morning. Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later today as well. You see, in life there are some problems that are big, that are overwhelming, that seek to take your life. They come for a little while, but then they go, and they're hard. They knock you down for a little bit, but then they're over. But then there are problems that stick around, that persist, that nag you, that wear you down. Irritants that don't go away. And here, Paul is being very transparent, he's being very personal and open with us, and he tells us that he's been struggling with his thorn for quite some time. That he has this nagging irritation in his life that persistently won't go away. Well, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Paul's thorn, because Paul never tells us what his thorn is. He never identifies it. There's been numerous guesses And several scholars have made educated guesses. The most popular uh, of guesses is that Paul is referencing his poor eyesight. Didn't know if you knew knew it or not, but Paul was hard of seeing. What leads to this conclusion or this guess that this might be what he's talking about? Well, you remember how the Apostle Paul came to Christ, don't you, in Acts chapter 9? He's confronted with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus as he's going to go persecute Christians He's encountering Jesus Christ on that road. And you remember what it says, that Jesus shows up and blinds him with a blinding light. Remember that? And it was so bright and it was so blinding that it dropped him to his knees. We're told that in Acts chapter 9, verse 8. And he loses his vision temporarily. In Acts chapter 9, verse 18, as his eyesight is restored to him, we're told that there falls from his eyes something that looks like scales. Could this be when Paul's vision problems began? All throughout the book of Galatians, he seems to talk about a physical infirmity that he's suffering. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 13, he just flat out says, I'm suffering from this physical infirmity. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 15, he says the Galatians would have given him their own eyes to help him had it been possible. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, his handwriting is recognizable, he tells them, because of the exceptionally large letters with which he's writing the letter to them, because his eyesight was poor. So could it be that Paul's thorn in the flesh that he's mentioning now in 2 Corinthians is the nagging irritant that he faced in his life through his poor vision? Another guess about Paul's thorn, and it's just a guess, but another guess is that Paul's thorn is a particular person or a group of people. And the reason for this conclusion is Paul says that his thorn in the flesh was a messenger. And a messenger is a person who delivers a message. We also know from Scripture that Paul regularly had people in his life who nagged at him. Remember in his second letter to Timothy, he warns Timothy to be on the lookout for Alexander the coppersmith, who did him much harm. We know that there were people in Paul's life who were a thorn to his ministry. People who constantly sought to discredit him or criticize him as a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, as you go back and you read 2 Corinthians starting in chapter 1, a lot of the book of 2 Corinthians is Paul reasserting his apostolic authority. Because there were those in the church at Corinth who were undercutting him. And they wouldn't go away. And every time Paul showed up, his critics showed up, and it was nagging him. It was a thorn in the flesh. Now we can't say with certainty what the thorn was experienced by Paul was. I like what James McDonald says about Paul's thorn in the flesh. James McDonald says, if God wanted us to know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, he would have told us specifically what it was. But that's actually good news that we don't know for sure what Paul's thorn in the flesh is. Why is that good news? Because you can put your thorn into Paul's context. 
But the reality is that Paul has a thorn in his flesh. He has this nagging irritation that won't go away. And for some, that's your reality. Maybe your thorn is loneliness. You've lost your spouse or you've never been married and you're lonely. Or maybe it's depression that keeps popping up. Or maybe it's memories of the past or regrets. That when you look back over your life, you wish you could have done things differently. If you have a nagging irritant that you've prayed for God to remove and he hasn't done it, well, we can only assume that it's there for a reason. Because as you know, we told you last week and we're going to tell you again, God is in absolute control of your life. There's no accidents. There's no coincidences. There's just God's sovereignty. And so looking at it from that perspective, then we have to ask ourselves this question, why does Paul have a thorn in the flesh? Thankfully, Paul spends the rest of our text telling us why he believes his thorn is there. And maybe if you have a thorn in your flesh, you'll find this helpful for you today as well. The first reason Paul gives us as to why he has a thorn in the flesh is because of his calling. Look back again at verse 7. He says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. There's the first reason why he was experiencing this thorn, and it was because of his calling. And by calling, this is what I mean. I'm referring to the divinely ordained purposes of God in his life. That's what a calling is. It's when God uh, divinely ordains purposes for you to fulfill in your life. Paul had a purpose that required a thorn. There were certain things that Paul got to see and that specific things that Paul got to do that were specific to him and his calling. And you and I will never get to do the things that Paul got to do. It's interesting because Paul says <clears throat> there in verse 7, because I was given revelations by God, because God revealed some things to me and through me, that's why I have a thorn. Well, what exactly was revealed to Paul? Well, it's cool. You can read about it in the first six verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul talks about this amazing experience that no other follower of Jesus Christ has ever had or ever will have. In the first six verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is describing his experience in paradise. He got to take a special trip to heaven's waiting room. And he is the only person besides Jesus Christ who got to take a special tour of this third heaven and come back and talk about it. You know the Bible speaks about three heavens, don't you? The first heaven is where the clouds and the birds live. The second heaven is where the stars and the planets live. And the third heaven, that's where God lives. And Paul says, I was taken up to the third heaven. And what Paul was exposed to in the third heaven, no one else has been exposed to, and it blew his mind. It floored him. And so one of the reasons that you and I can look forward to heaven is because Paul got to visit paradise, and he was amazed at what he saw. And so he says, because of the revelations that were given to me, because God, of God's exposure to me and my use for him, this thorn was part of that process. And that translates to your life and my life as well because there are times that God allows us to have thorns as a part of his plan and a part of his purposes to our life. Did you know you have a calling? It's different than Paul's calling. It's different than my calling. But make no mistake, you have a divine ordained purpose of God. And if you don't believe me, then you need to commit to memory Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. I memorized this verse early on and it's brought so much comfort to me over the years. It simply says, for we are God's workmanship, that we are his handiwork, we are his his work of art. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't that amazing? That there are things in this life that you're going to get to do that God has ordained you to do and you alone. There are things that Paul got to do that we will never get to do. But listen, there's things in this life that you get to do that Paul never got to do. That's amazing. And so that nagging irritation in your life, that thorn in your life has been allowed by God for a purpose and that purpose is to help you with your calling, to help you with your divinely ordained purposes. You may not understand it, you may not appreciate it, you may not even like it. 
but it's there, and it's God ordained. It's not luck, it's not chance, it's not fate, it's not karma, it just didn't happen. It's God's divine purpose for your life. Paul gives a second reason for the thorn. He says, to keep my sin in check. At the end of verse 7, Paul tells us that he struggles with sin. And you're like, Paul struggles with sin? The apostle Paul? The great missionary, the one who wrote 13 books of the New Testament, struggles with sin? Uh, Yeah. He may be a saint, but he's still a sinner, just like you and just like me. And Paul says, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And he repeats it again, to keep me from exalting myself. You see, Paul's sin problem is that he has a propensity towards pride. He has a tendency to be prideful. Anybody else struggle in here with pride or a big head? Paul could get the big head from time to time. I mean, look at his background. He had quite the spiritual resume. He looked impressive on paper. And his resume is listed in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. And he says, Although I myself might have confidence even in my flesh... If anyone else has a mind to put to confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. What Paul is saying here is, I am the man when it comes to following God. I do what I can to follow him. He was esteemed by his peers. And so Paul had to be kept humble because on his own, he wasn't going to be humble. He could start to let his privileges and his favors kind of swell his head a little bit. I mean, after all, Paul could say, hey, I was in heaven yesterday. Where were you? Paul could say, hey, I wrote 13 books of the New Testament. What have you done? He could get the big head. And so God gave Paul a thorn, a needle, to pop the balloon of pride in his life, to keep his sin in check. And sometimes God gives us thorns in the flesh to address an actual or potential sin in our life. Now I know what your tendency is in here, and it's my tendency to do that as well, to whenever we're experiencing pain or discomfort, we immediately go to this conclusion that I must be a sinner, there must be something wrong with me that God is trying to correct in me. And while that may be true, it may also not be true. Paul was very self-aware, so self-aware that he knew that he was weak. Are you aware of the sins in your life? And so his thorn was used in part to deflate him. (laughs) I like the description of what pride is. Pride is called the disease that makes everyone else sick except the person who has it. That's about right, isn't it? The disease that makes everyone else sick except the one who has it. Man, I'm so sick of that guy. Yeah, because he's so stuck on himself, right? It's kind of like the lady who came up to the preacher after church one Sunday and said, Pastor, I'm struggling with the fact that when I show up to church and I look around, I'm the prettiest one here. And the preacher said to the lady, Lady, that's not only a sin, it's a mistake. And sometimes God allows us to have a thorn in our flesh to deal with actual and potential sin in our life. And so if there's something nagging you that you cannot get rid of and that God won't get rid of for you, you need to ask yourself the spiritual question, is there some sin issue in my life? But buckle up because this third reason that Paul says that God allowed a thorn to come into his life just might mess you up a little bit. Paul says, the third reason I have this thorn in my flesh is because God allowed the devil to torment me. It says it there, verse 7, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. You see, the source of the torment was the devil. But wait a minute. Paul says the thorn was given to him by God. So now we're faced with this conundrum, a problem. 
You have one of the most spiritual men found in the New Testament. He was living for God. He was serving God. He was praying God. He entrusted God uh, with his life, and God entrusted him with special revelations to go to the third heaven to see things that no man has ever seen. Why would God allow the devil to do this to him? And what you're going to see in a moment is that God, in fact, did let the devil do this to him. Well, what we need to have is we need to have a theology of the devil. We need to have an understanding of Satan. And I know this could very well mess you up, but your thorn, that thing that is a nagging irritant in your life, is being caused by the devil while simultaneously being allowed by God. And that's God's sovereignty at work. That's God's absolute control in your life at work. Because his sovereignty extends even to the devil. And what I mean by that is this. God will use even the devil to accomplish his work and his purposes. That's the sovereignty. That's the control of God. I mean, isn't that what God did with Job? In the book of Job, we're told that one day Satan approached God and God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? How dare God say that, right? We get offended with that. God, you're going to ask the devil to take a closer look at me when all I've wanted is to remove the devil from my life and get closer to you? Yes. And so God will use the devil because there is some way that God wants to use you or maybe some potential sin that he wants you to address in your life. But what's important to point out is, of course, Paul's response to the torment. Because let's not forget, even though this was allowed by God, caused by Satan, three times Paul prayed that it would be removed from him. Not once, not twice, three times in his life, Paul pleads with God, God, I can't take this anymore. It's too much for me. Would you make it stop? We've all been there. We've all been frustrated with situations and circumstances in our life, and God refused to remove it. And the question that we have at the end of those long days is this, why would a God who is all-powerful, who I'm told loves me, would not remove this thing from me? Jot this down. This is helpful. Just because God is able doesn't mean that he is obligated. That's helped me a lot. That just because God can take it away doesn't mean that he has to take it away. Does that mess with you a little bit? Well, hang in there because that leads us to the final reason that this thorn was allowed to visit Paul. And I believe it's the same reason this thorn has been allowed to visit you. To demonstrate God's grace and power. As I was practicing this morning's sermon... I came to this point, and I want to call an audible, okay? Can I change one of the words in this point? To demonstrate God's grace and power, but also to remind you of God's grace and power. That's why this thing has been allowed in your life. To remind you of God's grace and God's power. What? That seems totally to contradict the fact that God is gracious and powerful. How are you going to tell me that God is not choosing to remove this thorn in my life Because he's gracious and powerful. Well, let me read verses 9 and 10 again. And God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul pleads with God to take this annoying, nagging irritation out of his life, and God's response is, nah, I'm not going to remove that thing from you. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to give you my grace. What's grace? I had a good conversation with someone uh, this past week about a reminder of what grace is. Uh, Grace is an acrostic Uh, I was taught this in Bible college. Grace is an acrostic which stands for God's reward at Christ's expense. And that's exactly what grace is, that we get to experience God's tremendous grace because of what Jesus suffered on the cross. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. It's there, and that's grace. Grace. 
some other definitions of what grace is. It's the favor that God bestows that is undeserved and unmerited that God does for us what we cannot possibly do for ourselves. It's demonstrated in forgiveness. It's the grace of God that makes salvation possible. And in regards to this thorn that Paul is feeling prick at him, God says, I'm not going to remove the pain brought on to you by this thorn. What I'm going to do instead is help you realize that my grace is all that you need in this life. You don't need to be comfortable. You don't need to have everything work out. All you need in life is my grace. You see, what God wants you and he wants me to understand is this. God is good all the time. That God can be described as being gracious to us. Even when life doesn't turn out the way that we want it. Or even when life doesn't go the way that we want it to go. Or even when God doesn't show up the way that we want him to show up. God is still good. My circumstances do not change the fact that God is gracious. That's what he wants us to come to realize. That he is still loving, that he is still grace-filled. And so at the end of the day, even though that thing in your life that is still nagging you is still persistent, hasn't gone away, can you conclude, can you still say, God is still gracious to me. He is still so good to me. His mercies are new every single day. Well, why not just get rid of it, God? Well, that leads us to the second thing that God is trying to remind you or to demonstrate in your life. He wants to remind you of his power He wants you to be witness of his power. And that seems contradictory on the surface as well. That seems backwards. Let me get this straight, God. You're not going to cure me. You're not going to remove this thorn in my flesh so that your power can be made known. It seems to me that if you want your power to be made known, that you snap your fingers and you make all well. That would demonstrate your power. That would remind me of your power. But that's not how God operates. Listen to what he says in verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. God's power is ultimately revealed to others when he works through us and in spite of our thorns. Not necessarily the removal of it. See, it's when the cars broke down that you get to witness the power of the tow truck. It's when the headache is pounding that won't go away, that you understand the power of extra strength ibuprofen. A lot of you know that I had that pesky tooth pulled this past week. Well, that was an experience. Never had a tooth pulled before. And one thing the oral surgeon did before he pulled the tooth was he came in and he gave me three shots of Novocaine. Now, did those three shots still hurt? Yeah. Did they feel good? Nope. But that little poke, those little three thorns in the flesh, if you will, were necessary to experience the power of the Novocaine to help prevent me from feeling a greater pain when he was yanking and pulling on that tooth. Took 45 minutes to get that tooth out. He brought out this thing which I could only, you know, I had my eyes closed. I'm sitting there. This thing that I could only imagine was like a, a, a cordless saw of some kind. That is, and I, I'm smelling the, the smell of burnt tooth, you know? And he's yanking on that thing. My whole head's jerking. I thought he was going to break my neck. I really did. But the whole point of that was this, that God chooses sometimes to allow thorns to come into our life, the little tiny pricks in our life, to help prevent us from a greater pain. And I was so grateful for those three tiny pricks. I wish I had some more today, okay? It's a demonstration of his power. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God loves weak things, and you need to understand that. God loves weak things. You know why he loves weak things? Because when that weak thing becomes strong, there's no question as to how it got there. There's no looking at it and being like, Wow, that thing got strong all of a sudden on its own. That's not how that works. God loves weak things because he knows that out of weakness, he can show his power and demonstrate that he can make it strong. And so if you're feeling weak because of your thorn, because of that thing God has refused to take away, if you're feeling puny, hold on. You're going to see God's power at work in your life. 
That's why God used a little boy named David to kill a giant. That's why God told Gideon to make his army smaller, not bigger. Uh, That's why the Savior of the world was born to a meek virgin girl named Mary. Because God chooses the weak things of the world to show you his power to the world. And in your thorn, in your weakness, God is going to demonstrate his power to the world who is watching. I want to conclude our time together by sharing with you from Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 through 32. It's the story of Jacob. You know his importance in the history of the nation of Israel. And in Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 24, we learn that Jacob begins to wrestle with what Scripture records as maybe a man, but we understand it is the presence of God. Whether in angel form, whether in the pre-incarnate person of Christ, we know that he's wrestling with God. And listen to what it says. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, the man touched Jacob's socket of his thigh so that the socket of his thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for dawn is breaking. But Jacob said to the man, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said to Jacob, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God, with men, and you've prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said to him, why do you want to know my name? And he blessed him there. And so Jacob named the place Peniel. And he said, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because the man touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. So what you need to understand here is that Jacob has this uh, miraculous encounter with God. He's wrestling with God. And if you know anything about Jacob's life, Jacob was always wrestling with God. Not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense and in the emotional sense. He was always wrestling with God. Here, this is a physical battle with God. And out of that, God does a miracle. He just touches his hip socket and it dislocates. I've been told that the hip bone is, the hip socket is one of the most strongest sockets in the world, uh, in the body that the only way for it to dislocate is for there to be some force of major trauma, like a car accident. And here, with the touch of a finger, it's dislocated. Only God can do that. Now here's what you need to know, is that this encounter with God left him limping the rest of his life. That every time Jacob took a step, he was reminded of that time when, oh man, I wrestled with God. It was his thorn in the flesh. It was his reminder that God was with him, even in pain. And your thorn in the flesh is a reminder that God is with you. That you might be able to uh, uh, be reminded of his grace and his power in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is is perfected in weakness. Let's pray.